In this video, I'll show how I built my hydrogen generator, which can make close to 20 liters per hour of pure hydrogen. Using water electrolysis to make a mixture of hydrogen and oxygen, or HHO, seems to be a popular project on the internet. It's easy to do, and the balloons make great fireworks by detonating with a supersonic flame front. But as fun as HHO is, I can't seem to find any practical use for it except maybe as a cutting torch for really small-scale work or when you don't have access to an oxyacetylene flame. Pure hydrogen, on the other hand, has innumerable uses. In my case, I want to attempt to liquefy it in a Joule-Thomson cycle by using liquid nitrogen for pre-cooling. Another use in cryogenics would be as a refrigerant for an oscillating flow cycle like a Stirling or pulse tube cryocooler. These typically use helium as a working fluid, but it's a non-renewable resource and very difficult to get in some countries. It can also replace helium in balloons or blimps, which has never gone wrong, except for that one time. Aside from that one incident, it's pretty great. In fact, it's even more efficient than helium as a lifting gas. And in chemistry, there's a seemingly endless list of reactions hydrogen takes place in. I originally tried doing this the dirty way, by dissolving aluminum and sodium hydroxide. And it does work, but it's quite a bit more costly per unit volume of hydrogen, and after getting blasted in the face with sodium hydroxide solution when my reactor tank exploded, I decided that I'd look into a different method. Industrially, the most common way of producing hydrogen is with superheated steam and methane flowing over a platinum catalyst, which then breaks up into hydrogen and CO2. Considering the price of platinum, I don't see myself doing that anytime soon. That just leaves water electrolysis as the only reasonable approach. Typically, the way this is done is with a stack of plates sandwiched together with a whole bunch of bolts to hold them tightly in place and some sort of membrane material to keep the two gases from mixing. If you read research papers on the subject, they're usually using some ridiculously expensive fancy polymer membrane, but you really only need something like ripstop nylon, which is porous enough to allow conduction, but the holes are small enough that the little gas bubbles can't leak across it. Problem is, every time I try to do the typical sandwich method, the gas gets leaked, and attempts I made with 3D printed cells also leaked, and let me tell you, a solution with a pH of 13 is not a pleasant thing to have leaking all over the place. Then I got another idea which should theoretically be leak-proof and trap all the hydrogen that's produced until it's ready to be moved elsewhere. After watching my dog drink from his upside-down water bowl thing, I realized that would be a really useful geometry for a hydrogen generator cell. The cathode would be placed inside of a glass bell, and the anode would be placed on the outside so the electrodes would be concentric, then the whole thing would be in a larger glass or plastic bowl full of the electrolyte. The wall of the glass bell would prevent the gas bubbles coming off the electrodes from mixing since they're always traveling upwards due to the buoyancy. Then a tube would be placed inside the bell that goes all the way up to the top, which I'd suck all the air out of, allowing the bell to be completely flooded while the outside water is still just open to the atmosphere without any seals. Of course, this tube would need a check valve on it to ensure gases could only flow out. Otherwise, air would backflow into the bell and push the water line inside of it back down. As the hydrogen accumulated, the water line inside the bell would be pushed down, which would allow me to see the exact volume of gas that had been produced. Of course, as the water line of the bell moves down from accumulated hydrogen, the water line of the bowl would move up. Since the water is loaded with sodium hydroxide, it's very conductive, so I could simply use a pair of smaller electrodes to detect when the water level reaches a certain height and trigger a small pump to pull the gas out of the bell via the tube. I think it's a solid idea in theory, but let's see if it actually works in reality. To mount the cathode, I made this ring thing, which will support the glass bell in the middle and has arms on the outside to mount the anode. Then the whole thing will live inside this Tupperware bowl. I kept the lid, but it's not there to seal anything off. It's just there to act as a baffle to keep the nasty salt spray from jumping out of the water, which tends to happen with an open container undergoing electrolysis. The electrodes are 015 inch thick strips of 316 stainless steel. This material won't last forever like platinum, but it should last several hundred hours. At the time of making this video, I've put close to 100 hours of runtime on my cell with only slight discoloration of the electrodes. The cathode sheet wraps around the fixture and has a narrower, thicker strip of stainless steel to connect it to the outside world. The strip has some heat shrink on it to prevent unwanted electrolysis from happening on its surface. Here you can see how it wraps around the bottom of the glass. Then the rings for the anode are screwed in place. These screws are also 316 stainless. In retrospect, I could have just welded these pieces of plastic together with a soldering iron. Then I screw on the anode sheet, then install this little bracket thing in the middle, which will serve as the base for mounting the little vacuum tube for extracting gas from the cell. I use silicon caulk instead of super glue to attach everything because it seems to hold up well in a high concentration of sodium hydroxide. Let's try pulling vacuum on the bell. 
The sudden bubbling is from the water line on the outside dropping below the bottom of the bell and letting a bunch of air in, so the cell needs more water in it. So here's the bell with all the air removed from it. I didn't get very far into testing before all of my 3D printed parts started to crumble, and it was at that point I learned that PLA will dissolve in sodium hydroxide. So all the parts had to be reprinted with something else. A friend of mine reprinted all the parts in ABS, which I didn't have at the time, and the cell was rebuilt after a couple of days. Here's the leads for the new cell. As you can probably tell, I'm expecting to pull a lot of current, which leads to an important question. How do you predict how much current you're going to pull with electrolysis? After a little bit of googling, I found this nifty chart that gave conductivity for a bunch of different solutions based on electrolyte concentration. Let's look at sodium hydroxide. The chart says that at 5% concentration, we'll get a conductivity of 206 millisieverts, or 0.206 sieverts, per centimeter. A sievert is the inverse of an ohm. So for example, 1 volt at 5 sieverts would give 5 amps, 1 volt at 10 sieverts would give 10 amps, 2 volts at 10 sieverts would give 20 amps, and so on and so forth. The per centimeter part is area over distance. In other words, two 1 centimeter squared plates that are 1 centimeter apart in a 5% sodium hydroxide solution would give 0.206 sieverts, so in theory that's a little over 1 amp at 5 volts. However, when it comes to electrolysis, there's one more factor in that equation which I'll talk about later. But first I did my own test to verify the numbers from the chart. After all, you shouldn't just believe everything you read on the internet. To do this, I made a small test fixture that had plates of a known area and distance and tested them with my power supply and various concentrations of sodium hydroxide. The results I found were pretty consistent with the chart, save for one very conspicuous difference. The solution didn't start conducting for any concentration of electrolyte until about 2 volts, so the simple assumption of I equals V over R isn't valid for electrolysis. Instead, the equation would be I equals V minus V threshold over R. According to the Wikipedia article on water electrolysis, this threshold voltage is theoretically 1.23 volts at room temperature, but in practice it seems to be somewhere between 1.8 to 2.0 volts. Okay, so that's how to estimate current, but what about gas production rate? A mole of water takes about 287 kilojoules of energy to separate at room temperature. The hourly production rate of gas would be the threshold voltage times the current times 3600 seconds for an hour, divided by 287,000. This gives moles per hour. At room temperature, a mole of ideal gas occupies about 24 liters, so multiply that number by 24 and you get liters per hour of gas output. This is the production rate of hydrogen, but the production rate of oxygen would be exactly half of that. If you're building a cell, you may be tempted to just crank up the voltage to increase the current, and this would certainly increase the gas output. Problem is, it's also reducing the efficiency of the cell and dramatically increasing heating. If you had 12 volts and 10 amps going into a cell, 10 times threshold voltage, or about 20 watts, would be going into electrolysis, and the remaining 100 watts would be going toward heat. Also, increasing the temperature increases conductivity of the solution, which would cause even more current draw and an eventual thermal runaway. This is why electrolysis is typically done with a constant current power supply rather than a constant voltage supply. If it is done with a constant voltage supply, designers typically try to keep the voltage as low as possible above the threshold to maximize efficiency and minimize heat. In industrial devices, usually each cell is somewhere between 2.2 to 2.5 volts. Based on my CAD design, I expected to have nearly 100 centimeters of conduction area, so at 5% sodium hydroxide, that would result in 18.7 sieverts, or 53 milliohms. However, with the glass bell blocking part of the path, that number would be a little bit lower. Originally, I planned to use a 3.3 volt supply for the cell, but I wanted a little more output, so I just got a 5 volt supply instead. I figured if the cell began to overheat, I'd just dilute the electrolyte a little bit so it wasn't quite as conductive. Based on these numbers, I should get 56 amps with a 5 volt supply. But again, the glass wall would reduce conductivity somewhat, and voltage drop across the leads would reduce the current somewhat too. I figured it would realistically be more like 20 to 30 amps. So I printed some extra widgets and started to mount all my equipment on a wooden board. Here's the 5 volt power supply, vacuum shutoff valve, vacuum pump, current meter, and a Gatorade bottle serving as a liquid trap in case the pump pulled too much gas out of the bell and started sucking out the electrolyte. I also got this 12 volt wall wart to run the pump and extra doodads which I repackaged into this 3D printed box. Here's a look at the full system. I originally had a 1 milliohm shunt for current measurement, but it was grossly inaccurate, so I replaced it with this Hall Effect sensor instead. 
I also added a little fridge compressor so the hydrogen could be stored in a tank under pressure once it was removed from the cell. I did a couple of test runs but found that the hydrogen was contaminated with oxygen when I did ignition tests. It's a little bit hard to tell from the audio in this video, but those bubbles went off with a pretty sharp bang rather than the lazy sort of whoosh sound you get if it was pure hydrogen. Turns out some of the gas bubbles from the anode were migrating across the gap because part of the anode sat below the bottom of the glass bell. The anode needed to be moved higher so that none of it hung below the bottom of the glass. To do this, I just added some extensions onto the printed arms that hold the anode. Rather than attempting to use glue that might react with the sodium hydroxide, I just used my soldering iron to weld the ABS parts together, which actually worked pretty well. Fortunately, I had plenty of headroom in the Tupperware bowl, and my anode still fit inside with the lid on. This time, when I did an ignition test on the gas, there was no bang whatsoever, just a lazy flame, so it looks like the hydrogen is pretty pure now. Starting at room temperature, the current sensor reads 25 amps, so right about what I expected. The output from the power supply is 5.21 volts, and the voltage across the cell is 5 volts even. So there's a 0.21 volt drop across the leads, which is a little over 5 watts at 25 amps. That's not too surprising since the leads get noticeably warm. Here's a closer look at the salt spray I mentioned earlier. Even without any boiling or big bubbles or high temperature, the microbubbles can launch themselves several inches out of the water when they hit the surface, which is why the water has to be covered with some sort of baffle and tubing extracting the gas has to have a filter on it. The gas still seems to be pretty pure, so now it's time to add a little bit of automation to the cell so I don't need to babysit it constantly. To do this, I used an Arduino with a little breadboard shield I built a circuit on top of. The board connects to relays that control the 5 volt power supply and compressor, and a MOSFET that controls the 12 volt vacuum pump. A pair of stainless steel screws are mounted to the lid of the cell. When enough gas accumulates in the glass bell, the water line inside the outer portion of the cell rises high enough that it contacts the screws. This has the effect of closing a switch that causes a transistor to pull down one of the digital pins on the Arduino. When the Arduino has read a low state on that pin for one second, it kicks on the vacuum pump for three seconds, which transfers gas into a beach ball or balloon. If the electrodes are triggered for more than 10 seconds, the program assumes something has gone wrong and it goes into a so-called panic mode and shuts everything off. The only way to clear the panic mode is to power cycle the entire device. There's also functionality and wiring meant for a switch to detect when the beach ball or balloon is full and turn on the compressor, but I never got around to actually setting up a physical fixture for that. Here's a time lapse of the cell filling up a latex balloon. You may notice that over time the current is going up. That's no error. As I mentioned earlier, higher temperature will result in higher conductivity of the electrolyte. Here's a graph of the temperature versus time. After three hours of running, the electrolyte reaches nearly 60 C. And here's a graph of amperage versus temperature. At room temperature, we start off just a hair above 25 amps, but at 60 C, we're over 40 amps. Fortunately, I didn't get any thermal runaway because the cell lost enough heat naturally and never really got above 60 C, but it's not a great idea to run the cell at 60 C for a long time because the ABS parts are going to be fairly soft at that temperature. Anyway, after one hour, my balloon started to float a little bit, and after two hours, it had no problem holding up the fill adapter and tubing. When I zero my scale with slack on the tether and then release the tether, I get minus 22 grams, which is the lift it's producing. Alright, so far I've got a cheap and dangerous replacement for helium to fill party balloons, but to fill something bigger, I'm going to need a way to store a lot of hydrogen. I originally got a 10 gallon steel tank for this purpose, but then I read that a phenomenon known as hydrogen embrittlement can cause the steel to crack and fail. This seems to be the result of those pesky little hydrogen atoms being small enough to tunnel their way through the lattice of iron atoms. I read that aluminum is far less affected by this issue, but my aluminum tank was currently being used to hold the ethylene for my cryocooler project. So I evacuated my steel tank, then set up a hose to equalize the pressure between the steel tank and the aluminum tank. Once the tanks were equalized, I used my trusty compressor module to force the remaining ethylene to the steel tank. Afterward, I removed any trace amounts of ethylene left over with a vacuum pump. Supposedly another thing that exacerbates the hydrogen embrittlement problem is the presence of moisture. That's a problem because the gas coming out of the cell is extremely humid because, you know, it's literally coming out of water. So I'm going to add this bottle full of silica gel in line with my pump output to dry the hydrogen. Just to show that it works, I have a little humidity meter inside this inverted Tupperware box. The humidity starts off a little over 40%, and when I blow into it, the container fogs up and goes close to 
Now I'm going to blow through the dryer bottle and we should see the humidity inside the container drop. And there you go. I think the humidity actually went close to 0%, but the meter is probably pegged at around 10%. So hopefully this will help mitigate the embrittlement problem. So after spending a weekend running the cell, I had enough hydrogen to fill this 10 gallon tank to 125 PSI, which translates roughly to about 320 liters of hydrogen. The cell puts out about 15 to 20 liters per hour, depending on the temperature of the electrolyte. To fill a much larger balloon, I've made this adapter with a chunk of PVC pipe and some 3D printed bits. 320 liters of hydrogen is enough to generate about 340 grams of lift, which is close to a pound. So let's strap this GoPro to the balloon and try to catch the sunset with it. Not a bad view, but I definitely need some stabilizer fins if I ever want to do aerial photography from a balloon. A drone might be easier. My string was also way too thick, which limited my altitude. I think I made my point though. When the flight was over, I removed the clip from the balloon nozzle and recovered the hydrogen back into my tank for later use. So I think that's a pretty good demonstration of what's possible with a little tabletop electrolysis cell. I think there's a lot of ways I could make this device even more compact and energy efficient, but for now I'm pretty happy with it. I didn't originally intend to do anything with balloons, but after flying one with hydrogen I made, I kind of want to try launching one of those high altitude weather balloons or even have my own RC Zeppelin like that guy who made an RC model of the USS Macon that actually floats. I used to build and fly RC planes and drones, but something about lighter than air flight seems so much more interesting, even if it's less practical. Anyway, there's one more thing I need to mention about electrolysis. If you're using stainless steel electrodes, they'll last for a reasonably long time, but not forever. Over time, they'll release various chromate salts into the water, which are bad for your health. Some of these could even have hexavalent chromium, which is particularly nasty. So if you have to get rid of your electrolyte after hundreds of hours of use, don't dump it down the drain. Put it in a bucket, let the water evaporate, then collect the precipitate in a plastic bag and drop it off to a toxic waste disposal site or stash it away in a government warehouse. Anyway, thanks for watching.